So the second talk in the afternoon session of this uh, our mini mini moon um, seminars number six uh, will be given by Doctor Shang Xu. Um, his Chinese name is Xu uh, Xiangwen, um, and Shang he he got his uh, undergrad um, degree training uh, at the at the uh, Taiwan's uh, normal National Normal uh, uh, University, uh, Suan Dasha. and then he uh, he came to uh, came to uh, Institute of Astronomy at the National Central University uh, to do his uh, master degree, and afterward, you know, he he continued his um, study uh, at the Potsdam in in Germany, and uh, um, shortly, you know, he after getting his PhD, he moved to to University of Colorado. And since then he has stayed there and his specialty is on, on, on dust, as in, uh, implied from the title of his talk. Um, he's, uh, he's a theoretician, uh, but also that he he's now working a lot uh, closely with his colleagues on, on experiment, uh, laboratory experiments uh, on the lunar dust, I think also on, the, on asteroids. However, you know, there's no air. But lots of dust. Now he, he will be interested in those problems. Sean, okay, please start. Great, thank you, Professor Ip. That is my pleasure to present some of the results here about the laboratory study of electrostatic dust transport. And and so I would like to, uh, in this talk, I would like to talk about the experiments and what are the findings and uh, uh, interpretations based on the measurables we can have in the lab and what are the implications uh, to interpret the observations on the moon and on Ellis bodies and, and what should we do next? And so, uh, so let's start. Yeah, so uh, in this talk, and, and if you look at the lunar dust environment, there are uh, uh, very different uh, uh, descriptions and what I, and for example, some people may refer to the near surface uh, environment where you have lots of lunar regulars and through exploration activities or other natural processes like uh, 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 like we suspect the electrostatic lofting processes that might be, uh, uh, the, the dust could have some to, to be active. And on the other hand, uh, there could be other more energetic processes like impact ejecta as shown on the right, which was explored by the uh, LADI spacecraft with the dust instrument on board. It detects the global uh, dust exosphere, which is driven by impact ejecta process from micrometeor impacts. And that has, that, that has been covered by uh, Professor Mihai Horani. Uh, and, and so my talk will be mainly focused on the last part, that is the near surface dust environment, which is about human or lander scales on, on the surface of the moon. And uh, here shows something that, that our recent efforts has been focused on. It's a pile of particles in vacuum chamber and simply by shining on UV light or electron beams essentially ionizing, ionizing uh, radiation onto it and it stopped to hop like a cosmic popcorn. And so this is, uh, this is not in real time, this is actually from a high speed camera, uh, a frame rate of 1000 frames per second. And so you can see the particles are following each of their ballistic trajectories and you can see some of them rotating and land on the surface with different uh, speed and, and height and, and, and sizes. And so that's the focus of our past efforts on characterizing these properties and to learn about the nature of electrostatic uh, dust loading process. And, and this work, most of the work has been done, has been led by uh, Dr. Zhu Wan, is my colleague at LASP University of Colorado, and also his students, which are very talented artists, Anthony Correll, Noah Hood, and of course, it's all under the Institute, which is a uh, NASA Surrey Virtual Institute with the lead of uh, Professor Mihai Horani. And so, um, and of course, 
uh, regarding space or planetary explorations, there's also always these three aspects. You have the space observations, which is something we need to understand, though, with limited uh, measurables that, that is either remote sensing or in situ. And we have to really do a lot of works to support our explanation to theoretical studies or laboratory, laboratory, laboratory experiments. And so regarding electrostatic dust transport, that uh, the observation is helpful regarding to provide environmental conditions like the geometry, when or how is that happening? Where is the location? How much particles or, or what is the level of activities? What are the plasma environment that could lead to such a uh, process to be observed or, or the gravity either on the moon or on other smaller Aldis body type? asteroids or comets and most of these existing information or observations are from remote sensing or imaging uh, or even hand drawing from the Apollo astronauts as it's shown on the right and from the theory or from the lab experiments we can learn other uh, processes which are not really measured uh, in, in, in space yet but through these, it, it provides the theoretical background and, and to, for us to really get the nature and, and see if our explanation of the space observation makes sense. And, and finally, we will be able to shake hands and, 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 and to have a comprehensive understanding about this process and their effects. And so, and so to what, what, what I think the lag experiment is very useful in combination to uh, to the uh, to the theory aspects of electrostatic dust lofting is is provide insights about the regular charging, how the particles can be charged, and 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 it provides specific constraints on their, for example, their charge polarity or how much the grains can be charged. And through this, we can calculate the force balance to see how much charge is possible is needed to allow particles to overcome cohesion and gravity to be lofted in, in, in air or into space. And, and, and through this, uh, uh, it will also provide inputs to, uh, for future instrumentations, either in situ characterization or remote sensing measurements. And from here, uh, uh, it's basically, we, we will establish a for loop between these three elements. And so uh, here it will be a, a very mini review about uh, electrostatic process um, uh, on the way. And one of the earliest literature I can find is this um, article called The Lunar Surface by uh, Gold from 1955. Of course, this is before the Apollo mission. And therefore, uh, a lot of things have our lot of understanding has changed, but I, uh, 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 reading this, I found also there are some insights that are actually quite, um, how to say, useful or, or precise. For example, this description um, about, oops, sorry, uh, let me try to get back here. Yeah, so this description about that electrostatic forces can rise either as a consequence of photo emission of electrons from surface due to ultraviolet light of the sun, which is based on our experiment, very true and, and very fundamental process is already discussed, I mean, uh, six decades ago. And also it states that this type of mechanism could be best investigated experimentally, which is what we are doing. And especially uh, interesting is that it, in, in the last sentence of this paragraph, they describe that if the process, if the particles were frequently dislodged by such electrostatic forces, then again, a net floor will result on the surface of such a body. And so to, to, to uh, and this kind of discussion somehow uh, resembled the uniformitarianism and uh, in comparison uh, to it is the catastrophism, such as the discussion, uh, early in the development of geology about the age of the earth, how, how, how you form these rock formations and such. And of course, on the moon, we know that uh, cratering or, or in this case, the catastrophism uh, mechanisms are, are, are the major uh, shaping forces of their surface from ancient impacts. 
but this doesn't exclude that other subtle process less energetic but operate more gradually on the long term scale could still be active and and provide uh, 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 and, and also important in the sense that that explain what we observe and so one of the questions which I don't have to answer is could electrostatic transport be such a gradual process in compare uh, in a company with the, the the cratering and other process shaping the surface of the moon and so there are other um, more precise observations uh, since then of course from the surveyor 7 lander uh, which observed with this camera point to the um, um, uh, sunset side uh, once the it, the spacecraft passed terminator on, on the surface of the moon it showed this called lunar horizon glow that is a uh, kind of a, a bright cloud hanging on the edge of the horizon uh, where the sun is set. And these are interpreted as electrostatic lofted particles with a uh, height of tens of centimeters above the surface, and those scattering light reach the camera and lead to this uh, horizon glow. And also from the sketch of the uh, Apollo astronauts on orbit, they are observed these high latitude streamers from their visual uh, uh, invest. Uh, uh, on their visual records, their drawings, and, and and all these kind of indicating some levels of activities, which which is yet to be understood, and that points to the electrostatic dust uh, activities on the surface, and also there's an instrument deployed on the surface by our Apollo astronauts. It's called LEAN, the Lunar Ejecta and Meteorite Experiments which is detecting particles, charged particles, passing through the instrument uh, and, and know their directionality and, and flux. And one of the early results from Berg 1976 is that, that the, the instruments observed enhanced events during the sunset and sunrise, basically crossing the terminators, the instrument uh, 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 found that a lot of dust activities However, later works by analyzing different lean data sets by uh, Professor Gun and, and Horani shows that there is no significant enhancement as described in the Berg et al, 1976. And, and so there are some controversy. And what we try to do is to understand if electrostatic, electrostatic dust transport is a, a valid process and, and one of the issues that has been discussed uh, for, for decades is actually this, that uh, considering how electrostatic, active, uh, electrostatic charging could provide enough repelling force to overcome gravity. And so uh, uh, let's consider a very simple scenario that we have a surface, uh, a sunlit surface, which means on uh, Earth's bodies, like on the moon, you would develop a photoelectron sheath. That is, the pho electrons are excited uh, by the solar UV uh, radiation and therefore uh, forming these uh, uh, photoelectron sheaths, which is about a scale of uh, 10 meter ish on the moon. And so, if you have a particles which will expect the also charge positively on the surface because of the UV ionization, and 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 you we, we know about the photo uh, electron temperature which will tell us how what is the potential on the surface and we also know the scale of these sheets or, or, or the photo electron sheets and we can calculate the charge density based on gauss's law which is basically uh the the electric flux that that went through the surface and if you do so you will end up with a uh, charge density which is mean here is the mean surface charge density uh, uh, sigma is about three times 10 to the minus four electron per micron square. That means on average, each micron square surface area or, or roughly a, a micron sized dust particles will have only, uh, 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 you need to have a, a thousand, uh, a 10,000 of them to get one of, one of that particle to carry one additional uh, charge which means that on average, 
the, the grains are uncharged and therefore there is no sufficient electrostatic force to uh, accelerate them from gravity to levitate or, or even loft these particles. And this has been a major theoretical issues uh, uh, for, for, for study of electrostatic dust transport. And of course, there are uh, ways that people propose to, to mitigate these issues. For example, uh, 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 in, this, in this case, there are basically two kinds of ways. The one is people suggest that for, for the electric uh, field from the, for, on the charged particle to be large enough, if the grain is not charged high enough, then the electric field must be very strong. And therefore, in, in, in cases where you have plasma wake or near the terminator where one side is illuminated and, and the other side is not, you can expect there to be stronger electric field between these uh, 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 sites with different uh, potentials. And so this gives the, the, the idea that, that, for example, if there's a, 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 a when, when crossing the terminator or at the shop boundaries like the crater walls, they could have stronger electric fields and therefore lead to a, 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 a possible uh, electrostatic activity locations. And the other part of the, the other way to mitigate this theoretically is to uh, assume kind of uh, inhomogeneous charge distribution, either in time or in, in space, that, that some particles, uh, so what we derived previously is that the grains on average have no charge, but some grains, because the stochastic nature of this charging process could have uh, uh, anomaly, uh, uh, I mean, unusually large charge as shown in these simulations, which is certainly true if you consider the quantized nature and the small amount of charge. And, 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 and though um, these are not fundamentally changed, the scenario we consider as the grain charging on the surface. And so while these two are, are theoretically possible explanations, um, um, we found that such uh, explanations are not really satisfactory compared to the laboratory results. And in a way that, for example, uh, what we have observed is that the first, the, the dust activity, the lofting process starts when it is directly under um, ionizing uh, radiation, like the UV rate or electron beam, which is not the case as suggested before. And the second case is that uh, we, we, we don't see, we, in, in a lot of cases, uh, of course, it depends on your uh, ionization radiation flux, but uh, the entire surface of the regulars can be extremely active. So it's not just one out of 10,000 particles is active, but actually the entire surface is moving and therefore could, it is modifying itself through dust transport, size sorting and microstructure modification, in fact, as I would discuss later. And so the, the, the experiments actually help us to understand to, so this is basically the same slide as I showed before, that, that there is, might be something fundamental that we don't get it correctly before. And so from these experiments, uh, Dr. Xu Wan proposed this new charging model called patch to charge model. And that is the fundamental idea is that each part, so the particles are insulators. So each part of the surface could charge differently depends on their geometry. And because we are talking about regular surface, it is likely to be porous and there will be presence of these micro cavities. And so uh, as enumerated here that on the outward facing side of the particles, it will be charged positively because of the UV ionization, the photo emission. But inside the micro cavity, the, where the surfaces of these grains are shielded from the direct uh, UV ionization, it will actually co collect uh, electrons, secondary electrons or photo electrons emitted from the illuminated patches. And uh, if you apply the same Gauss's law, and, and we know that the potential between these surface, between the red outward facing, uh, uh, inward facing and the outward facing, the blue ones, the potentials will be similar 
in the order of a few votes or 10 votes roughly. And but because the, the scales of inside the micro cavity is orders of magnitude, could be six or seven orders of magnitude smaller than the size of the, the, the photoelectric sheets, you essentially compress the whole sheets into such small cavity that increases uh, electric field and charge density. That means the grains can accumulate a lot of uh, electrostatic charge through this micro cavity or this patch charging model. And of course, there are some direct implications from these uh, model is that the, the charge density on the red surface will be much, much higher than the charge density on the blue surfaces. And, and also, uh, it, 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 for, uh, so the de de delta uh, sigma here on the red is much larger. And also it, it implies that the charging of regular surface is not a surface effect, it's a volume effect. So you need to consider the 3D configuration or at least 2D configuration is not really a particle, a, a perfect sphere sitting on the flat surface scenario. And also this is a subdivide scale plasma surface interaction, which is not really well studied. And, and, and the presence of porosity or microcavity really is a crucial element and actually under this scenario aggregates or regular shape or particle shape come into play in such scenario which is also verified in the experiments that aggregates are more uh, easily to be lofted compared to spherical uh, uh, dust grains and on the charging side this one very important aspect is that even on the UV radiation, which you expect particles to be charged positively, the lofted grain will be charged negatively. And, and this is the one significant difference that can be measured and characterized compared to previous theory. And, and, and so also from the force balance perspective, interparticle repulsion is more important than the sheet selective field. It's not to say that sheet selective field doesn't have a effect, but I just say it's it's a, a secondary or a play the minor rule. And so uh, basically this phenomenon we observed in the lab is actually should be universal uh, everywhere because the, the ionization radiation needed to activate such process is not really, is, is quite typical uh, for, for endless bodies in the solar system. So this paper published in 2016 by one and all uh, basically uh, described what, what I just said. And so the, the, on the left, it shows the experimental setup that we have a vacuum chamber with uh, filaments providing electron beams of background plasma and, and, and that uh, dust sample on the regulars there sit in the pit lies on the center of the chamber. And through different charging processes, for example, in the middle panel, we have different, uh, different charging processes. We observe the lofting of particles and comparing their, uh, by measuring their turning point of the trajectory, assuming a, a simple ballistic, uh, high school physics ballistic trajectory, we can um, calculate their vertical initial speed through very simple uh, 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 camera observations. Uh, and, and you can see that their initial speed is in the range of uh, about tens of centimeters per, per second. And, and, and we also notice that the electric fields from the sheets actually play a rule, play some rule, but not the fundamental ones. And the next paper published is by uh, one of the previous students of our group who performs a, a charge measurement of these particles. And so you can see on the setup on the left that uh, they're adding a, a grid, a, a charge grid on the dust surface, and also there's a Faraday cup that can move in to measure the charge of the lofted particles. And so in the middle panel, it shows that when uh, uh, the experiment goes as follows, that first we, we, we shine lights or electron beams on the dust sample, and then when, after that, uh, assuming part of them are charged, we turn off the ionization radiation and move the grids in, and apply different bias potential of the grids to manually pull the particle uh, from the surface. And the result is that, that once when we apply the negative uh, uh, bias 
great potential as shown on the bottom panel, no particles are um, removed. And, and but, but if we applied a positive bias potential, particles are actually pull away from the charged regulars. And this provided a strong constraint that the charged, uh, the regulars despite under ionizing radiation, uh, the, the ones that can be locked is charged negatively. And, and this polarity is one crucial uh, uh, distingu distinguisher between the pad charge model and previous uh, theories. And also by using the Faraday cup, we can measure how much uh, charge carry on these grains. And, and as you see on the right, at uh, different conditions, plasma and electron beam, electron beam only, or UV radiation only, that, that the, uh, uh, to, from, from the measurement point of view, the match between the expectation and the measurements are, are reasonably well. And in the UV radiation case, well, we, uh, uh, we, because the, the UV light in, the, in this lab um, setup is not really have, uh, uh, the wavelength is not really short enough to simulate the solar UV radiation. And therefore we, we don't expect the, uh, the charging to be, uh, we expect the charge to be lower and therefore we cannot really have the four characteristics of the conditions on UV radiation. But I mean, uh, in general, this agree with the proposed patch charging model quite well. And next, we start to move on to focus on the characterization of the dust dynamics of the hopped particles dynamics. And one of the thing, of course, is to characterize the activity rate. And so we have uh, by then uh, a, a typical uh, camera, but also a high speed camera. So uh, we can characterize the particle then on the um, on the outer rim of this pit, or we can actually track how many particles are lofted in air by using high-speed cameras. And the results are shown in the middle panel, so either both methods are quite comparable, and it shows that the, the activity peaks shortly after the uh, in initiation of the experiments, and then fall exponentially and to a, a kind of a steady lower level. Uh, after tens of minutes. And uh, by comparing the electron beam current and the uh, maximum of this peak of the activities, we show, a we, we show a linear relationship. And if we kind of extrapolate or, or uh, uh, we try to compare the conditions on the lunar surface, which you expect based on the secondary electron flux. And and we can expect that and up to five particle per centimeter per second of lofting can be expected on the lunar surface if the surface is fluffy and, 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 and you know, uh, suitable for electrostatic lofting. And this rate is more than enough to explain the lunar horizon glow observation or based on the interpretation of the, 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 the lowest observations. And what comes next is that in addition to characterize their initial speed, we also use high resolution, high speed camera imaging to get, to measure the particle size and to derive their relationship between the particle size and the launch speed. And this can be compared with what we predict about the grain charge and, and the repulsion between uh, uh, particles from, from these pad charge models. And we derive the relationship, basically follow a uh, uh, inverse uh, 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 proportion that, that the launch velocity inversely proportional to the particle size, which is not surprising. But you can see that we expect particles uh, roughly 10 microns to be lofted about uh, a meter per second speed, which is actually High, much higher than small bodies sitting than, than the escape speed of some small body like Bennu, one of the uh, 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 near Earth asteroids that's been visited visit by Osiris Rex uh, spacecraft. And so um, all these results are from our lab, but importantly, we are not the only one doing this. That is, an independent group in Japan also use similar methods studying electrostatic dust transport, and they have similar, very similar results. 
As you can see, the setup is really similar. Uh, ionization source on the top with the dust on, in the middle. And, uh, and, and you can see the, from, from the side view observation, dust does hop in their setup. So it's not something unique in Colorado, but it's, uh, 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 um, um, it, it, it's, it's quite repeatable is what I want to say. And the lofting uh, vertical launching velocity they measured is comparable to what we have. And interestingly, they also report these grain movements, uh, uh, a lateral grain movement that's shown in the bottom panel that the particles actually move from left to right throughout the experiments. And this is uh, kind of led me to the next topic that is about uh, the ferry castle structure. So the fur puzzle structure has is basically some uh, loosely uh, kind of branch-like structure that people have inferred to be present on the moon. And what is shown here is a, a, a kind of a time series of snapshots of one of the experiments. Uh, you can see the time mark. At the beginning, you have a pile of particles and with the uh, ionization radiation with time, and some structures start to develop and, and also destructed continuously. And, and so it's like a, a, a patch of materials that has become active just by shining light on it. And you can see there are some structure developed with these resembling the description of these fairy castle structure. And what is in, interesting is that now we know the, the spectroscopic properties of a regular surfaces de determines on many factors, for example, the grain size distributions, the surface structure, and of course, the material composition. And, and on the right, you see these plots that, that for different, the same uh, composition of materials, but with different sizes, you have a different spectra shape and slope and simply because the, the scattering properties of between size of particles are different. And also, if you have a packed surface or, or some more porous castle, uh, fairy castle-like structure, you expect to have some uh, effects, for example, here in the mid-infrared that the emissive or the refractance does shows that, that, that with fairy castle structure, the, the, all the structure, the contrast are, are much lower. And so um, uh, in, in, in other words, this, these two wondering that, that could electrostatic process also have some other effects that was not known before. And for example, uh, on, on the surface of the moon, there are these features called cold spots. And those are spots observed from the uh, mid infrared so they are thermophysical anomalies and that are uh, observed around the craters and they show a different degrees of fading or, 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 or uh, uh, fading in, in, in at, at different craters. And so on the left, you show the, the diviner radiometer results with these uh, dark spots, it's the cold spot, but on the crater on the left, you see a much fainter events, and and by studying the statistics statistics of these cold spots, they derive the fading scales is roughly and, and compared to the cratering age, they 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 think the these fading uh, uh, or, or the time a lifetime scale of the cold spot is roughly in the order of a million years, and so they did fade away. And one way to explore them is to observe them on during a solar eclipse. Um, so the lunar surface is, was lit and then temporarily shut down. And by measuring the temperature, you can somehow infer that these cold spots might be uh, areas with relatively high thermal inertia. And so um, one hypothesis we are thinking is that could that the, the impact ejector creating from the impact of these form, formation of these craters actually destroy the, the microstructure on the surface. And but through times, these microstructure can be rebuilt 
from electrostatic activities and then gradually erase these cold spots. Or uh, on other types of uh, uh, geo uh, uh, features on the moon is the lunar swirls. So these are albedo patterns, uh, uh, which are usually brighter patterns that is uh, show some spe specific features or, or, or structures, and most of them overlie on a magnetic field anomalies. And so, for example, shown here is the famous Rhino gamma swirl, and the overlapping is the magnetic field come towards. And 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 while uh, a lot of study has put in, and we know that space weathering or the darkening by the exposed to the solar wind definitely has some effects with the formation of the swirl. The, the origin of how these structure forms is not really well uh, resolved yet. And so there are uh, hypotheses like, uh, because the, the structure of the magnetic field, you might introduce some uh, interesting electromagnetic environments that allowed particles to be uh, transported to find uh, dust grain to be transported there and lead to a, a brighter albedo in, in the swirls. Or there's uh, another theory that by compacting the, the soils, you can also bright up the, 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 the regulars with the same composition. And so there are various hypotheses that can be actually uh, test in the lab to understand the origin of the swirl and of course more importantly will be to send an instrument like one is under development under uh, Dr. Xu Wan it's an instrument called electrostatic dust analyzer which is really uh, kind of tiny for space instrument uh, with uh, reasonable weight and low power consumptions that is tailor tailored to monitor the electrostatic lofted dust on the lunar surface. And then of course, uh, talk about dust, you, you cannot, on, on moon, you, you, you will have to talk about dust hazards, which has been brought up more than once during the mini series talk today. And it has been uh, an, an, an issue at the back of many people's head when, when, when people talk about sending people back to the moon, of course. And, and as shown on the left, you see the, the, the spacesuits of the, uh, Jack Smith shown here is quite dirty. And that's because uh, it's the lunar dust, the moon dust is quite adhesive that once it's uh, attached to a surface, it's really hard to get rid of. And also they are sharp, they are abrasive. And therefore, once they creep in, into the joints of the spacesuit or, or any movable parts, it could be, it, it could result in mechanical issues. And if you bring into the living, uh, 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 sector of the astronauts, uh, uh, they have reported uh, uh, irritation on the skin or when you inhale, you will smell some kind of uh, 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 funny sensations. And all these are, are possible issues that need to be mitigated. And the proposed part charging um, model uh, or, or, or these mechanisms is actually providing one of the possible solutions by doing a shining, for example, electron beam, which is uh, controllable, uh, you can actually clean up uh, surfaces covered with dust. And so, for example, shown on the right is uh, for, for the case with the spacesuit material we got uh, in the lab, and also the, the glass, um, which, for example, could be used on the solar panels. And by shining electron beams, you can significantly clean uh, the, the, the covering dust without even really have to touch the surface. And so uh, up to here, I talk all about our works and, and about the moon, and I would like to slightly switch gear to asteroids. And uh, as you know, asteroids are much smaller and, and, and one of, of course, one of uh, some the most exciting news recently about asteroids are the simple returns carried out by Hayabusa 2 from JAXA, uh, from the asteroid Rugu, and also from NASA, the Osiris Rex uh, mission, taking sample back from asteroid Bani. And so if you see these uh, closer images, you can see the, the surface of these tiny asteroids 
is really rough. So there's not uh, clear evidence of fine grain materials like uh, the fine grain regulars see on the moon. And so, so the question will be that, uh, as you can see here, there are three different airless bodies. On the right, you have a regulars covered moon. In the middle, you have a mid-sized asteroids about 10 kilometer ish size uh, arrows, which shown here with its very uh, famous uh, dust punts is the, the flat button uh, surface of the equator, which was interpreted as uh, particles being electrically lofted and fill the bottom of the equator. And on the left, you have these very rough uh, boulder dominant surface of asteroid Bennu. And so the, 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 the thinking is then, how, what, what are the process shaping the surface of these different eldest bodies? And early uh, uh, discussions about these has been addressed this to the, the gravity of the body. Of course, we know that the moon has a much higher escape speed than small asteroids, which uh, as you can see here, but uh, we now know that thanks for these exciting asteroid mission, <clears throat> that um, actually uh, the, the, the earlier thinking is that the, the fine grain materials are produced through impact processes, impact fragmentation, and the small bodies are simply too small to have sufficient gravity to retain the fine grain material. But we now know that from the small carry on impact uh, deployed by Hayabusa to mission, which is excellent. And you can still see that even on a body of a kilometer size, there's still a significant fraction of ejecta are, are, are retained on the surface, as you can see the darkening of the impact site in the vicinity of the impact site showing the middle panel. And so uh, certainly fragmentation by impact is one of the uh, process that need to be considered, but it might not be all process uh, responsible to the production of fine grain regulars. For example, uh, thermal fragmentations might be uh, actually more dominant fine grain material production process, as in showing the lab that the fragmentation rate of uh, uh, a meteorite samples by repeating the heat cycle in the in the lab is actually uh, the fragmentation could could actually be orders of magnitude more efficient given the nowadays impact rate and the fragmentation cracks has been suggest uh, has been uh, 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 interpret as the cause of these cracks observed on Bennu and also these uh, ejecta. Uh, ejection events of centimeter and cent, uh, millimeter size of particles launched at, at, at meter per second speed are also attribute to the uh, breaking of the, the surface rock by thermal fragmentations. And so this might be actually a more dominant process and is not depends on the size of the body. So in other words, the earlier thinking that small body don't have enough gravity to retain fine grain materials might not really be working because the thermal fragmentation to be dominant fragmentation process. And so uh, in our recent work, we put these three processes together, thermal fragmentation, impact jacta production and escape, as well as electrostatic lofting uh, into uh, consideration of bodies at different sizes. As you can show on the horizontal axis is the object radius from 0.1 to uh, 1,000 uh, kilometers. So basically the moon is on the right and the small asteroid on the left. And the vertical axis shows the regular fine grain regulars production and loss rate. And the red curve shows the loss rate and different components of it. And the blue one shows the production rate. And the interesting part of course is the, where they intersect in that the production equals to loss. And we found that at one AU, this radius is roughly equals to one kilometers. That means um, on the right hand side of the screen area, you will expect the regulars to be, or fine grain regulars to be accumulated on the surface of earliest bodies larger than one kilometer in radius. 
and smaller than that, you expect the rate, the, the final reactants to be depleted because uh, electrostatic lofting actually uh, is efficient enough to remove all the fine grain reacts produced. And we have been asked that, yes, it seems like electrostatic process can, re can remove tens of micron particles or even 100 micron particles, but how about millimeter particles, millimeter size particles? And so we perform these um, um, very simple calculations that we consider a micron size particle, a millimeter size particle, and a meter size folder. Uh, in, and, and we describe how they are eroded by uh, the electrostatic process. The small one will be removed by electrostatic process, while the large one will be fragmented and produce smaller uh, sizes of particles and replenish them. And we found out that uh, if you have a, a relatively high electrostatic removal rate, the smallest populations, actually you this will lead to an enhanced exposure of your larger particles into the space element and, and that will increase their fragmentation rates because for example, you will, assuming you have a, a thick regulus covering your, your a meter size folder and any impacts or, or the heat cycle from solar illumination will be less affected or, 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 or the fragmentation of larger border will be much lower because of the shielding of the small uh, fine grain regulus. And once you remove that, the production will actually, uh, or the erosion will propagate to the size distribution to the larger ones and therefore lead to a coupled uh, grain size evolution on the surface of these bodies. And therefore, the gravity does matter, and this could be a, a coupled uh, regular size distribution evolution with the uh, 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 effects. And somehow similar to these, um, and, and so the observation we have on bending on arrows on the moon could be simply attributed to this and very similar to the erosion, erosion that the fine grain, grain regulars are, are removed. And, and finally, you have this lag deposit or desert pavement-like scenario on the smallest body. And what are the implications of these bodies, uh, of the, the loss of angry regulars? And of course, one of them, we know the replenish of nearest objects uh, from the asteroid belt is through uh, 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 orbital drift and, and also the resonance. And so, um, by and and so uh, imagine a, a frag, frag uh, uh, a piece of uh, impact fragments from the asteroid belts, and they will experience Yakovsky orbital drift, which is induced by the uh, solar radiation and depending dependent on their uh, thermal inertia. And by having a a bare rock surface or a fine grain regulus covered sur uh, surface will have different thermal inertia and therefore will af uh, affect how fast they drift from their uh, initial location to the resonance site uh, with Jupiter and will be sent in to become a near Earth asteroid. And so that means uh, this process might actually not just affecting their surface, but their orbital evolution as well. And, and also how much nearest populations we will expect from the main belt. And of course, it's also uh, might be affecting the spectroscopic properties. As we described before, the particle size is, um, it, 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 is uh, the, the spectra of the same material could be different if the particle size are different. And actually by Increasing the particle size, you have the opposite effect of the space weathering that you change the space flow in the opposite trend. And so it might also come into play with, for example, the interpretation of classification of asteroids, like the X complex, we have a Q type and S type spectra simply uh, interpret as the effect of space weathering and, and, and could electrostatic dust erosion of the fine grains play a role here? We, it is still yet to know. And then further on, uh, to my second last slide, is that, that there are other in, in indications that similar processes may also happen beyond 
uh, inner solar systems on other endless bodies as well. And especially I want to mention these 10 micron emissivity features that, that plays a very uh, interesting uh, indication of um, uh, 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 that it is require a very high, a highly porous surface in able to uh, reproduce such emissivity features. Uh, and, and therefore, um, it's highly possible that the castle, uh, fairy castle like structure <clears throat> induced by electrostatic transport might be indicated from these 10 micron emissivity feature. And so, this is the summary. We talk about the path charge model proposed by Xu Wan, and it provides a theoretical understanding. Uh, which is fundamentally different from what we know before. And, uh, and, and it, the, the prediction has been uh, examined and supported by various lab experiment results by different groups of people carrying out similar experiments. And uh, such understanding will help us to develop space instruments to carry out uh, in the future. And also it can serve as a dust hazard mitigation method and, all, and, and, and uh, on, on the surface of Eddie's body, uh, regarding the surface of Eddie's body, electrostatic dust transport could be a shaping process, uh, operate at microscopic scales and, and gradually, but, but uh, steadily change in the surface properties. And that might come into more importance if the surface or, or if the, it, it actually affects the dynamics of very small asteroids. And finally, we definitely need more lab experiments as well as a dedicated in situ instrument to, to get the ground truth of electrostatic dust transportation in, in space. And that's my talk. Thank you so much. All right. Um, John, thank you so much uh, for thank this uh, very comprehensive presentation. The, um, I would like to ask the, the audience whether they have questions to, to ask uh, Sean, uh, Dr. Dr. Xu first. If you have, please unmute yourself and then ask the questions. Uh, well, we still have a couple of minutes to ask a, 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 a one or two questions. Um, then I would like to ask a question, you know, um, the, the one thing is that about the, um, you know, you, you talk about this uh, uh, irradiation of the dust layer by by uh, by electron beam or or uh, ultra uh, violet uh, radiation. The question I have is uh, how uh, how do you compare them to the solar radiation or to the in natural you know in natural uh, situation uh, with the solar wind and so on. So um, in this case, so energy wise, I think uh, uh, what what we need is the. Uh, 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 a flux of ionization radiation. So energy-wise, I, I think that, that that shouldn't be an issue. And so from the, um, if going from the um, full electron flux or secondary electron flux perspective, you can see here that it's comparable about three times, uh, 0.3 times to 10 to the 10 electron per center square per second. And so roughly this value you spec at one AU. And so projected to the activity level, that is what, what we get here, about five particle per centimeter per, per, per second as the peak uh, amplitude of the activity. And so energy-wise or, or flux-wise, it's, it's quite compatible. So we don't think you need really a uh, uh, unique situation to get electrostatic happening based on the laboratory results. Right, but then the throwing also have protons, right? They are the same flux as yes. the electrons. Yes, yes, absolutely. So so in, in a way that, I mean, we, we all know that the, the um, if we go back to the, the model, of course, with, with, the, the <clears throat> with protons, then it will, of course, reduce the effects and actually, um, the experiment here that in, in the top case, we not just have electron beam, but we also have ambient plasma. 
so it's uh, it should serve as a neutralizing uh, uh, medium that reduce the 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 cavity charging, but nonetheless the the process still happens, and so I think as long as you have sufficient um, um, ionization radiation and the yield of photo electron or secondary electron high enough from the material, then this could be active. Okay, the the second question is that uh, you know if you go back to the previous slide, I think I think the 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 previous one, uh, even the yes. previous one. Uh, uh, anyway, one 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 slide you have is so the time uh, time dependence of the the oh. the this one? yeah that one right in the middle diagram you see that the after uh, one thousand two thousand seconds uh, the the uh, uh, the rate you know the ejection yes. rate uh, tend to tend to decrease and that yes. is uh, you know is there's a very short time you know for for in the cost rate times so. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think in this case, um, we don't expect the activity to be at the peak always. And, and from our observation, certainly the, um, the activity can, um, how to say, will dissipate really quickly as shown here. But you can always see that there are some way of activities down the stream that, that is more gradual but it's still there. And it's difficult to categorize because of the time scales. But I think this might be the, the case. And especially if you have some resurface process, external resurface process like impacts, you might actually create fresh, in terms of electrostatic lofting, fresh surface that could allow this activity to happen again. Yeah, but still, you know, this is the only one hour's time scale. You know, that, that, um... And the, the thing is this, uh, with the, at the beginning, you have this uh, very casual uh, structure and after two or three hours, what happened to the surface? Uh, would they just uh, the dust rearrange themselves so that to, to seal themselves from further kind of this kind of supercharging? Um, yeah, I, I mean, eventually, yes. But also another thing about a study of very casual structure is that I think that might be rather difficult to do this really on Earth, because here the gravity does matters, and uh, and and extent of how these collective behavior of regular particles will will be affected from from and 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 supposedly very different from those in the microgravity environment. But but yes, I agree. Um, so so there are still works to do, but somehow. Uh, from the initialization of the electrostatic processing aspect, I think the pad charging model provides a rather satisfactory explanation. Another thing is that you know you may have thought about it already. The 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 Ben New at Ben New, uh, uh, it was observed that there were uh, dust streams, right, streamers coming out from from the from the surface. Yes, and they, they those are kind of outbursts. You know, they cannot. Be due to the supercharging effect because you cannot keep on charging no, this no. spot. Yeah. No, I, I think it's difficult to explain those ejection events by by electrostatic dust uh, uh, mechanism, mm -hmm. and and I think what what people have been su suggested is the exfoliation. So so you have some basically the 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 thermal fragmentation that you have really expand your rock and then at the moment it breaks you have this initial momentum that that set particles away i think that is a more sensible explanation mm -hmm. yeah okay great um hope you keep on working on this and that's a really very interesting thing you know that, that this uh the 2016 paper certainly you know raised a lot of questions an interesting phenomenon um yeah and, uh, so I have to let you go because uh, uh, the next uh, speaker is on the line. You know, I think I, before he, mm -hmm. he 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 goes away, you know, I have to catch him. Uh, Sean, I thank you <laughs> yeah, so thank much. You. Right. Thank yeah. you for the opportunity. Yeah.